You just heard from the Deputy Secretary General, Amina Mohammed, on the Financing for Development Report. On the that, on that same topic, I want to flag that the Secretary General's brief on debt and liquidity will be published on Monday, and we will be sending you embargoed copies of that on Friday. Also on Monday, the Secretary General, along with the Prime Minister of Jamaica, Andrew Holness, and the Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau, will convene the Financing for Development in the Era of COVID-19 and Beyond, meeting of heads of state and government on the international debt architecture and liquidity. At 11 a.m., the three of them will hold a press briefing. The Secretary General will be in the press briefing room and the two leaders will join virtually. That briefing will replace the Monday noon briefing. Today is the International Day of Remembrance of the Victims of Slavery and the Transatlantic Slave Trade. At a General Assembly event, the Secretary General honored the memory of the millions of people of African descent who suffered immeasurably under the evil of slavery, slavery and the transatlantic slave trade. The Secretary General noted that while the transatlantic slave trade ended over two centuries ago, the ideas that propelled it remain alive today. In Europe, the United States and elsewhere, he said, white supremacists are organizing and recruiting across borders. We must counter all lies of racial supremacy. By tackling inequities and inequalities, by building inclusive com communities and economies, and by educating about history, we truly honor the memory of the victims of slavery, the Secretary General said. We've shared his full remarks with you. As you know, the Olympic torch relay began today in Fukushima, Japan, ahead of the T Tokyo Olympics this summer. In a tweet, the Secretary General says he salutes the participants as they carry the symbol of hope and resilience across the country. He also conveys our best wishes to Japan and all Olympic athletes. Today, the Deputy Secretary General spoke in a video message on behalf of the Secretary General at the opening ceremony of the conference named Reinforcement of the Role of the EU in Global Health, which was hosted by the government of Portugal. She noted that the COVID-19 pandemic has claimed more than 2.6 million lives and caused a socioeconomic impact of unprecedented magnitude in contemporary history. Ms. Mohammed added that the pandemic has exposed the grave risks of underfunded health systems and the chronic lack of investments in pandemic preparedness. She said that it should now be clear to all that without ensuring every person's right to health, we will never have just societies. Tor Wenesland, the UN Special Coordinator for the Middle East Peace Process, briefed the members of the Security Council by VTC this morning. He said that we have witnessed a spike in demolitions and seizures of Palestinian-owned structures, which include internationally funded humanitarian projects. Mr. Wenesland urged Israel to cease demolitions and evictions in line with its obligations under international humanitarian law and to approve plans that would enable these communities to build legally and address their development needs. He added that COVID-19 continues to have a devastating effect on Palestinians. In addition to the brutal impact on public health, the recurrent lockdowns, school closures, and reduction of commercial activity have severely undermined living conditions. The special coordinator said that support to the Palestinian COVID-19 response should be significantly enhanced to ensure that Palestinians receive a fair and timely share in the distribution of vaccines. Mr. Wenesalan said he is deeply concerned by the daily violence that continues to fuel mistrust and drives us further from a peaceful resolution of the conflict. He's particularly concerned that children are so often the victims. Children should never be the target of violence by any party, nor be exposed to violence, he said. On the issue of the FSO Safar, I just would like to note that discussions with the Houthis, who call themselves Ansar Allah, are ongoing to resolve all pending logistical and security arrangements. We hope these discussions will come to a conclusion soon so we can pin a timeline of deployment. There was also a technical meeting with the government of Yemen to brief them on the ongoing efforts to deploy the mission at the earliest possible opportunity. The UN's Emergency Relief Coordinator, Mark Lowcock, today released $14 million from the Central Emergency Response Fund, or SURF, to help tens of thousands of Rohingya refugees after a devastating fire tore through the Kutupalong camp, the world's largest refugee camp in Cox's Bazar in Bangladesh. That fire on the 22nd of March displaced more than 45,000 Rohingya refugees and affected many others. A hospital and other health, critical health, nutrition, and education sites were destroyed. The funds will help set up and rebuild shelter and provide people with emergency services, including water, sanitation, food, and mental health assistance. Mr. Lokok said that Rohingya refugees need our support now more than ever. 
as the pandemic continues to take its toll and the monsoon season is coming. He noted that Rohingya refugees themselves have always stood shoulder to shoulder with the aid workers, volunteering their services to support response efforts in the camps. Now is the moment for the international community to stand by them. On Myanmar, the UN team in the country is deeply concerned by the impact of the political developments on vulnerable people in conflict-affected areas. The UN team is helping some one million people, one-third of whom are internally displaced. Aid agencies' work is hampered by disruptions to the banking system and limited availability of cash, as well as challenges to the supply chain. Active conflicts in areas such as northern Shan and Kachin also make the situation difficult for humanitarian organizations. The UN team is also concerned about the low level of funding received for the humanitarian response plan. Only 10% of the nearly $270 million needed has been received so far. Also on Myanmar, you saw yesterday that we took note of reports that hundreds of demonstrators have been released. We remain concerned at ongoing arbitrary arrests, including of journalists and civil society leaders. We call for the release of all those arbitrarily detained, including President U Win Mint and State Councillor Da Aung San Suu Kyi. We continue to follow developments closely and are also extremely disturbed over the killing by security forces of a seven-year-old child in her home this week. There must be accountability for all the crimes and human rights violations that continue to be perpetrated in Myanmar. We continue to call for maximum restraint. The UN mission in the Central African Republic, MINUSCA, says its patrols help prevent looting by armed groups in Markunda in Wuhan Prefecture yesterday. The mission has also increased patrols in parts of Nana Mamber Prefecture following clashes between the country's military and armed groups. Earlier this week, the mission helped to launch an awareness campaign on the peaceful movement of cattle, which can be a major driver of violence in the Central African Republic. Turning to Latin America and the Caribbean, the UN Children's Fund today said that 114 million children are still out of the classroom in the region. This is the world's largest number of children without face schooling. UNICEF said that to date, only seven countries in Latin America and the Caribbean have fully opened their schools. In 12 countries and territories, schools remain fully closed. In the rest of the region, classrooms are partially closed. During school closures, some 45 million students in 24 countries in the region have been supported by UNICEF in the provision of distance programs, and 9 million children, parents, and primary caregivers have received mental health and psychosocial support in the community. More on this is available online. From Honduras, the UN resident coordinator, Alice Shackelford, has condemned the assassination of Juan Carlos Cerros Escalante, an indigenous leader and climate activist. Ms. Shackelford and our human rights colleagues call for justice and for the protection of indigenous leaders and human rights defenders. And we have a COVAX update today from El Salvador, which says so far has received 85,000 vaccine doses with more on the way. The UN team has been working for months with health authorities in the area of logistics, among many others. The first batches of vaccines will be given to health workers and people over the age of 50, living with conditions such as diabetes, hypertension, and respiratory diseases. Staying in the region, the Food and Agriculture Organization today launched a report to show evidence of, a key, of the key role that indigenous and tribal peoples play in preserving forests and reducing carbon emissions in Latin America and the Caribbean. The report reveals that deforestation rates in the region are significantly lower in indigenous and tribal territories where governments have formally recognized collective territorial rights. It argues that improving the tenure security of these territories is an efficient and cost-effective way to reduce carbon emissions. The report is available on FAO's website. The Vienna-based International Narcotics Control Board today launched its annual report for 2020, highlighting a global hidden epidemic of drug use among older people. According to the report, as the world population ages, the number of older people with drug use disorders has been increasing. However, this development has been largely overlooked. The International Narcotics Control Board also expressed concern about the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on the global supply chain of medicines. The report noted that people with mental health and substance use disorders have been particularly affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. The full report is available online. Today is also the International Day of Solidarity with Detained and Missing Staff Members. In his message for the day, the Secretary General says that we recognize the extreme dangers encountered by so many colleagues as they carry out the vital work of the United Nations. The Secretary General notes that the threats vary from deliberate and deadly ambushes to kidnappings, intimidation, and unlawful detention. But the threat is the same, he adds. 
He emphasizes that these are unacceptable obstacles to fulfilling our mandates and advancing peace, sustainable development, human rights, and humanitarian assistance around the globe. And before I end this briefing and turn over to Brendan Varma, I would like to thank very much our friends in Benin as they have paid their regular budget dues in full. This takes us to 76 fully paid up member states. And now I will take your questions. I see uh, that James and Edie have their hands raised. So uh, James first and then Edie. Yes, uh, if I can, Farhan, I'd like to ask you about Tigray. Um, uh, I can't hear you, James. I am speaking through the microphone. Can you hear me? I am speaking through the microphone as close as I can uh, put I, it to I, my I'm mouth. Sorry. Uh, can someone fix this? I, I'm, not, I'm not able to hear uh, the microphones from the room. Uh, it's on. Hold on. I'll keep talking so we can see if it gets fixed. Oh, I, now, I can, I, now I can hear you. Start again, please. No problem, um, Farhan. I'd like to ask you about Ethiopia and Tigray, please, if I can. I have a couple of questions. First, a report from Médecins Sans Frontières that says that their staff witnessed executions taking place uh, on the road from Adigrat to Mekele. Uh, they say that Ethiopian soldiers stopped their car and two minibuses, which were public transportation vehicles. The soldiers then forced the passengers to leave the minibuses. The men were separated from the women. The men were shot. There were more than four of them, and the MSF driver was executed. What is the UN's reaction? Well, these reports are horrifying. And uh, they certainly need to be looked uh, uh, into and uh, investigated thoroughly. Along those lines, I'd like to say that the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission and the Office of the UN Human High Commissioner for Human Rights today said that they have agreed to conduct a joint investigation into the human rights violations and abuses allegedly committed by all parties in the context of the Tigray conflict as part of the much needed accountability process for the victims. Both organizations have been closely monitoring their human rights situation since the start of the conflict. They remain concerned about reports of serious human rights violations and abuses and the devastating impact of the conflict uh, on the civilian population. And, uh, and so they will look into this, and the deployment will start as, as soon as possible for an initial period of three months. And you had something further on this? I, I, I have two follow-ups, if I can. There was an important uh, briefing um, for member states by OCHA in the last couple of hours. I say in passing that it was not of acceptable broadcast television quality to be able to put it on television, which is most unfortunate, given the content was very important. Um, they were briefed by the representative of international NGOs uh, in Ethiopia, who said there had been an improvement in, um, in bureaucratic access impediments, but visas were only being issued for one month, making things difficult, and ongoing fighting was making things difficult. How does the UN currently view the humanitarian access to Tigray? Well, on, on that, I mean, the, the basic point is that we have been saying uh, and reporting uh, uh, an overall improvement in the situation. Uh, so uh, we've, uh, we've appreciated the cooperation in terms of getting uh, 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 people into Tigray uh, in a more efficient and uh, expedited way. At the same time, of course, uh, we want all obstacles uh, to deployment in Tigray to be, uh, to be removed, and we're mm -hmm. hoping for a continued improvement in, in the access uh, that we have. Uh, does the Secretary General think raising um, uh, the problems of humanitarian access and humanitarian concerns is legitimate because the Ethiopian permanent representative seemed to belittle that. He said in the meeting um, a short time ago, we love statements, but people don't eat statements. We love to see on Twitter your concerns, but people don't eat tweets. Uh, what is your reaction to a statement like that, where, uh, which is responding to international concern, which has come from member states and, of course, from the UN itself? We believe that in all the work we do, that both public statements and the use of the bully pulpit, as well as uh, private uh, diplomacy and negotiations, are equally useful in terms of getting progress uh, towards concrete improvements uh, of the situation on the ground. So we will continue to raise uh, the concerns we have in public where it's useful, and we will also continue to do the sort of work we do at the ground level, at the headquarters level, trying to make sure that uh, 
all of the humanitarian uh, situation, uh, including problems of access, can be resolved. Uh, and with that, uh, Edie? Uh, thank you very much, Farhan. Two questions. The first one, uh, the UN Rapporteur on Myanmar has called for UN member states to hold an emergency summit uh, on Myanmar to try and spur international uh, action to reverse the coup. Uh, does the Secretary General support the holding of a summit? Uh, well, that's one proposal for the member states to consider. What the Secretary General supports is for the member states to consider uh, all possible helpful actions that can reverse this coup. Uh, that is our goal, and we want uh, the, this, the, the member states to come together in whatever way is most useful and most effective at uh, bringing about a restoration of, uh, of uh, the uh, democratic system of governance in the country. Um, my second question is that uh, North Korea launched two uh, ballistic missiles today. Uh, does the Secretary General have any reaction to these launches which do violate UN sanctions? Well, on that, what I can tell you is that the Secretary General is concerned by the latest developments on the Korean Peninsula. He reiterates the need for the Democratic People's Republic of Korea to renew its diplomatic engagement with the parties concerned and to work for peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula. Diplomatic engagement is the only pathway to sustainable peace and complete and verifiable denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. And uh, with that, uh, I'll turn the floor over next to James Reinald. Um, thanks so much, Farhan. I hope you don't mind. I've got three questions, if I could do them consecutively. First one is on the Ethiopian Megadam dispute with Sudan and Egypt. Um, the parties are going for mediation in Abu Dhabi next week. Is the UN sending anyone, and do you have a message to the parties? Uh, I'm not aware that we uh, have any role in this particular process. Um, for our part, we reiterate the readiness of the UN to support all efforts toward reaching an agreement on the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. And as you know, the Secretary General has welcomed initiatives to move forward the negotiations and awaits agreement from all the parties as to how the UN can best support this process. Uh, what's your next question? The Boris Johnson has been answering questions on whether or not British forces would take part in a UN deployment to supervise a ceasefire in Yemen. Obviously, we need to have a ceasefire in Yemen before you can supervise it. But is there some kind of conversation going on about this kind of potential deployment through the UN? Uh, I, I wouldn't go into any details about uh, the sort of background discussions we have while we're preparing for things. Uh, obviously, we don't have uh, a ceasefire yet, so that's the first step. And then beyond that, we can work on figuring out uh, how best uh, to monitor uh, that. But we are in touch with different member states to see what they're uh, willing and able to provide, and we'll continue with those discussions. And, uh, and then your last one before we turn over to Lena. Um, yeah. Um, uh, your colleagues in Geneva have confirmed that high-ranking Saudi officials did indeed issue a death threat against your rapporteur, Agnes Kalamar. Um, what's the message from the Secretary General to Riyadh? Uh, the Secretary General's message is very simple and very clear that any and all such threats uh, are unacceptable. Uh, okay, uh, we'll go first to Alensa, and then I believe there's someone with his hand raised in the back of the room. So, Elena first, and then whoever you are with both your hands raised, you get it after that. Elena? Hi, Farhan. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, this is about Mozambique. There were um, more armed attacks in Palma in the northern region of Mozambique and very close to an enormous international gas project. 
Um, so that made the civilians trying to hide in the woods, in the forest, but uh, and also the communications are cut. Uh, I wanted to know what is the UN's reaction on the situation, considering that security forces are saying that Palma is under siege. Yes, uh, we are following closely the situation in Palma town, and the attacks that reportedly began on the 24th of March and continue today. Uh, there's limited information on the incidents so far. Uh, we remain concerned about the violence in Cabo Delgado province, which is driving increased displacement of populations and leading to a rapid deterioration of the humanitarian situation in the region. The United Nations stands ready to continue to support the people and the government of Mozambique in urgently addressing the humanitarian needs of the affected populations. Uh, and with that, uh, I'll turn back uh, to uh, to the room. Uh, who, whoever it is, uh, is, is that Alan? It's Toby. Farhan, I'm sorry, sorry. Oh, yes. I yes. have a second question. I was muted, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, uh, also, what is the UN doing to protect the UN staff and the UN colleagues? Um, how are they being protected uh, at the same time as they try to work on the ground in Mozambique? I, we always make sure uh, that uh, that um, our our presence on the ground, our staff and related aid workers are protected. In in this case, um, there were several aid workers in the area when the attack started. We're communicating with all relevant contacts to ensure that these aid workers are able to safely leave the area. Uh, okay, uh, and then to I think it's Alan. No, no, it's Toby. Yeah. Hi, hi, Farhan. Can oh, you can you hey, hear me? Hi, Tim. Yes, I can hear you. I can see you as well. Sorry about that. Just flailing wildly here in the background. Uh, two quick questions for you. One, the um, the Deputy Secretary General said today that six countries are now in uh, financial default, with 42 having been downgraded uh, for their credit ratings. Uh, first question is: Is the UN uh, anticipate or expecting this number to rise? Well, we actually will have more um, to say about the issue of debt, debt liquidity. Uh, we're going to have a, a report that we hope to share with the correspondents under embargo, uh, possibly by tomorrow afternoon. But in any case, that report will be launched on Monday, as uh, as I said at the start of this briefing. And you'll also get to hear on Monday from the Secretary General and from the Prime Ministers of Canada and Jamaica. And then they'll talk about how serious this crisis is and how we need to deal with it. Okay, thanks. Noted. Uh, we'll be sure to follow that next week. Also, uh, just um, wondering where the latest panel of experts report is uh, regarding sanctions on the DPRK. Usually it's been uh, published by this point uh, every year, the final report, and it's, uh, it's still not up. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's I think it's being worked on. Uh, once it goes uh, to the Security Council, we'll let you know. But but we'll we'll check where in the pipeline it is. Um, and with that, uh, we turn over to uh, Maggie Bashir. Hi. Uh, on the DPRK answer that you gave to um, Edie. Uh, you didn't say whether the Secretary General believes that the latest missile launches are a violation of UN Security Council resolutions. Does the Secretary General believe that? Well, as you know, it's up to the members of the Security Council to determine what's in violation, and we have no doubt uh, that uh, they will be seized to this matter, and we will report uh, to them on, uh, on what uh, the latest incidents have been. But uh, but ultimately, uh, uh, we we'll leave it. We we'll leave that in the matters that hand in the matter of the relevant uh, sanctions committee and of the council members. Okay, uh, and after that, uh, Ephraim Kusaifi. Thanks, Farhan. Hello. There was uh, breaking news this morning. Um, the Houthi spokesman said that the Houthis are ready for good relationships with Saudi Arabia. And I was wondering if the Secretary General has any reaction to that. Thank you. Uh, we uh, have been very hopeful that there would be an improvement in relations between the various uh, involved parties. And so any uh, any, any uh, rapprochement between uh, uh, the government of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and Ansar Allah would be welcomed. And, uh, of course, Martin Griffiths is in touch with all the parties, and we'll see what can be done uh, 
to help uh, bring the parties closer together and get to a resolution of this conflict. Um, Abdul Hamid. Uh, thank you, Farhan. I was listening uh, to the briefing of the of Mr. Uh, Winsfield, uh, Winsland, and I have two questions. First, when he was talking about the provocative statements by officials from both sides, he gave three examples from Palestinians and very harsh examples. And he gave one mild statement from an Israeli member of the Knesset, which is that is very unfair. And I want to ask him through you why he did that. And I can give him 20 statements, especially during elections, that is targeting the Palestinians, dehumanizing the Palestinians, threatening the Palestinian of ethnic cleansing, etc. So that is one question. The second question, when he uses the word in response to that Israel conducted a raid in Gaza, which ended up with eight injured Palestinians, in response, what does that mean in response? Isn't occupation itself a reason for Palestinians to resist occupation? Why is there right in response that is he just he is giving a justification to the Israelis to commit these atrocities against civilians? Why is that? I need an answer for these two statements. Thank you. The the answer to both questions is the same. That Mr. Venislan uses his best judgment in terms of determining what information uh, 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 to put into his briefings to the Security Council and how best to portray it. And we have uh, confidence in. Uh, the, his selection of material and the words that he uses. Ultimately, uh, dealing with parties is always a series of judgment calls about how you present different matters. And it is his role as a professional diplomat uh, to weigh all the various factors in doing that. And uh, we simply trust his judgment on that. And with that, I wish you all a good afternoon. And I'll turn the floor over to Brendan Verma. Brendan, over to you. Thank you very much, Farhan, and good afternoon, everybody.